Happy Sabbath, everybody. Pastor Ron here. So glad that you've joined us this morning online. We are in a series entitled My Journey, My Life, My Exodus. And uh, this is part three, part three. So if you've missed the last two, no worries. Go to our uh, our YouTube page, Pontiac Southside, or our Facebook page, uh, certainly for Pontiac and Detroit Center. And you can catch up on this really uh, phenomenal, I think, if I do say so myself, <laughs> uh, spiritual life-changing uh, series. This series is, uh, we're, we're taking a journey through the book of Exodus, mainly through the main character's eye, uh, eyes, eyes of, of, of Moses. And some may argue the main character of Exodus is actually God, but maybe from a human standpoint, it's Moses. And um, we just really think it's a fascinating, fascinating uh, book. And so we have really enjoyed the last two installations. Today will be our third installation. So again, welcome to you online. Welcome to you uh, at Pontiac Church. Uh, I, I know that I'm not there physically at the Pontiac uh, Church, um, but you, you're watching. You're there physically. Those of you who've come to church physically and you're watching uh, me on screen, um, hey, welcome. We're, we're glad that you're here. And if there are any visitors with us at Pontiac Church, we welcome you. Thank you for hanging out with us today. And uh, don't forget next week for both churches, really for all LRC churches, uh, we will be all shut down because of camp meeting, which will be virtual. That's next weekend. And then back uh, on our June, July, sorry, July 3rd, we'll be back uh, in church. And so um, I'm excited for that. So, hey, uh, if you have your Bibles with you, uh, turn with me to the book of Exodus and and the reason why, uh, for those of you who are at Pontiac Southside Church physically, the reason why I'm, I'm preaching just on video, of course, I'll be, I'm at Detroit Center uh, throughout the entire day. We're, we're having a meeting uh, there coming up, and it's, it's really important uh, for me to sort of be there and so forth. So I'm excited for that. But um, usually if I'm not at Pontiac Southside, I, I'd have, you know, one of our elders speak. Uh, but this series, I've been really doing an immense amount of studying leading up to it. And, um, you know, if I wanted one of the elders to be a part of it, I would have told them this months ago so that they would have been able to spend time studying. And so I didn't want to just throw it on them, you know, the last two weeks. And so uh, I figured I would continue sort of the uh, the, the fluidity of the series by being here. I know I, I, you, I would love to be there person physically, but at least this is the second best thing. All right. Exodus chapter two. I got to tell you, I, I'm at the church recording this message and it took me about three tries just cause man, this neighborhood could be noisy, man. These, these dudes driving with their loud cars, music, and their engines are loud mufflers. And so I was like, ah, so anyways, I'm starting it, and if you hear something go by, it's because we're in the community, all right? Exodus chapter 2, I'll read really quickly in your hearing. Verse 1 through 10 should be on your screen. If not, I'll read as smooth as I can, all right? Verse 1, let's go. Now, a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi, and the woman conceived and gave birth to a son, and when she saw that he was beautiful... Talked about that two Sabbaths ago when he was Tov, saw that he was Tov, he was Yefe. Uh, she hid him for three months, but when she could not hide him anymore or hide him no, no longer, uh, she got him a papyrus basket, right? We talked about that basket, basket under divine protection, the ark, uh, and covered it with tar and pitch. Then she put uh, the child in it and set it amongst the reeds by the bank of the river Nile. And his sister stood at a distance to find out what would happen to him. And, and she really had no idea what would happen to him. That must have been, you know, somewhat excruciating, right? Looking uh, at her brother hobnobbing down the river Nile. We talked about uh, what was in the river Nile at that time, dead babies and other critters like crocodiles. Verse five. Now, the daughter of Pharaoh, this is where we'll be spending time today. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the Nile. Uh, someone could say, well, hang on, Pastor. You just said the Nile had like critters and dead babies. Well, 
you have to understand that they could cut off parts of the Nile, barricading it from uh, these critters and these corpses. So this is definitely one of it, all right? Um, now, the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the Nile and with her female attendants walking alongside the Nile. And she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave woman and said, and she brought her to him and she brought it to her. Verse six, when she opened it, uh, she saw the child and behold, the boy was crying. He was what, everybody? He was crying and she had pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrew children, Hebrews children. Verse seven, then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, it's quite bold, this young sister, this Miriam, uh, said to the Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go call uh, a woman for you who is, who is nursing from the Hebrew women so that she may nurse the child for you? That's bold. It's bold to walk up to the princess, the daughter of Pharaoh, and then to ask her, hey, do you want me to go get a Hebrew woman to nurse this baby for you? Pharaoh's daughter, verse 8, said to her, go ahead. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh, um, then Pharaoh's daughter, verse 9, said to her, take, we'll come back to that word, take this child away and nurse him for me. And I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. Verse 10, finally. And the child grew. Notice all throughout these last couple of verses. We don't get the name yet. It just says the child, the child, the child. There's a reason for that. And the child grew and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. And he became her son. Then Pharaoh's daughter, right? She named Moses. She named him Moses and said, because I drew him out of the water. Some had argued, was it, was it um, Moses' mom who named him? Uh, but clearly we see here it's Pharaoh's daughter uh, because she says, I'm calling you Moses because I took you from the river now. I drew you out of the Nile. I've entitled this message this morning, it's a very interesting title, and I know some of you may think, well, we got kids here, but bear with me. I've entitled this message, The Naked Woman on Wall Street. The Naked Woman on Wall Street. What does that have to do with Exodus? Well, hang on for just a couple of moments, okay? Um, Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time. We're grateful to not just only be online uh, so that we could uh, share together this experience of opening your word, but grateful for those at Pontiac Southside who are watching right now in the physical, uh, Father, in the building. And we just pray, Lord, that whoever is listening, that they, uh, they relinquish self, including myself, and that we are made totally receptive to your bidding, your functions, your calling. Thank you, Jesus. We love you in your name. Amen. The naked woman of Wall Street. You know, um, oftentimes when discoveries happen, uh, certainly when archaeologists unearth uh, things, there's a, a, a high level of excitement when, when ancient relics are found. And I, and both myself and Francis, we are quite enamored with archaeology and uh, watching uh, programs and watching, uh, uh, reading books, uh, articles about the discovery. There's something about discovering something, not just, I guess, ancient uh, artifacts or relics, but just discovering anything. When you discover that you have a talent, when you discover uh, that, uh, you know, one of the greatest discoveries of all time is when you're when you're not looking for money and you're getting ready to do laundry, right? And you go get your pants ready to put into the line and you realize it's ten dollars. Come on, that's that's a great discovery. Ten dollars in your pocket. Um, it's crazy because when you're actually looking for money, you can't find it. But but discovery is nice. Good discoveries, obviously. You there there could be negative discoveries as well. But yeah, so I, I love ancient findings and uh, of relics and, 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 and artifacts and, and architecture and so forth. And so you got you to gotta understand the excitement I felt uh, um, being in Israel years ago 
And uh, I remember driving in the bus and the uh, tour guide said, all right, our next stop will be the recent findings of Herod's tomb. And I thought, no, no, that can't be because three, four, five months before going on this trip, I remember doing an exhaustive, exhaustive, it was a documentary uh, on Herod's tomb and that they did not know where it was. This was in 2010. Oh, 11. And then we went on our trip in 2012 and the, and, and the tour guide said, that's our next stop. And I said, sir, I thought, is this another? Because they haven't found it. He said, no, we actually just found it about a year ago. It's been uh, perfectly excavated and, and now we could go in. I'm like, whoa. And when I got there, it, was, it just blew my mind. I loved it. Right. This uncovering, this discovering, unearthing of something uh, that is ancient, which is interesting because it's ancient. It's old. But to us that's alive today, it could be presented as something certainly uh, brand new. In a border town uh, on the far eastern edge of the Roman Empire, some 1,740 years ago, Persian soldiers held the garrison of the Dura, uh, Europa uh, under siege. The town was nestled on the western banks of the Euphrates River in what is today eastern uh, Syria. The Roman city was surrounded by massive walls that kept uh, danger out. All right? The building on the town's western edge ran close to the wall. A narrow street separated them from the only thing keeping the Persians, their enemies, out. Naturally, when Yale University archaeologists uh, excavated the, the Dura 17 centuries later, they would name this particular path with all the walls, they would name that path Wall Street. They called it Wall Street. As the Romans inside Dura grew ever more alarmed at their fate, <laughs> uh, they filled the Wall Street with rubble, uh, the better to strengthen the wall that was keeping the Persians at bay. In addition, they added tons and tons of sand and dirt to reinforce the wall. However, the Persians overcame this blockage quite easily, actually, and they entered the Dura and defeated the Romans. Then in 1920, years later, uh, British troops camped out near the Euphrates uh, River, <coughs> discovered some paintings that excited archaeologists. From 1912 through to 1937, Yale University archaeologists uncovered an amazing amount of art and architecture that blew their minds. Apart from the churches and the temples uh, which were discovered, and a synagogue uh, on the Wall Street was also unearthed. Among the many paintings which were discovered by the archaeologists, one particular painting, or fresco as it's called, stood out to them. This fresco depicted a naked Egyptian woman in a different river called the River Nile as she retrieved a crying baby in a basket. This being the earliest painting of Moses which ironically has his face unpainted, depicts the salvation in its weirdest yet glorious sense. It's sad because since then, about, I don't know, three, four years ago, ISIS, since this is sort of northern Syria, has since destroyed this wall. But this painting goes all the way back almost 2,000 years ago. And I think I'm showing it right now. If not, forgive me. I'll send the pictures. I'm, I'm planning on sending the pictures. It's a fascinating, fascinating, uh, uh, you know, art and fresco. You know, this has been such an amazing journey so far. We, by way of recap, we were introduced to the story in Exodus 1. We, the Israelites, 
are are about to be enslaved by a pharaoh that uh, you know exclaims, "I don't know Joseph." And I and I reckon as I as I as I read that phrase over and over and over again, I reckon it could stand for two reasons, or, or two definitions. The first definition, when he says he does not know uh, Joseph, is that he's certainly lying. He has exceptional knowledge of Joseph, right? That's like an American saying they have no knowledge of of Abraham Lincoln or no knowledge of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, if that's the case, that's quite sad, right? But these these pivotal, monumental characters in American history, you ought to know. I, I think this stands the same with Joseph, this 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 Hebrew boy, this once a prisoner becoming the savior of the land of Egypt and the surrounding diaspora. This this viceroy, this prime minister, as it were, saving the Egyptians from the clutches of uh, of imminent death, right? How do you not know? So I think when he when that when that statement is said, he's either lying that he doesn't know Joseph, or 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 the or the statement implies that yeah he knows Joseph, but he doesn't know Joseph. Are you following me? So he knows about I should say he knows about Joseph, but he is not intimately or integrally or emotionally or even mentally connected to, to Joseph as the previous uh, pharaohs uh, were. But, but here we are, what, regardless of what it is, here we are, the, the, the people of, 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 of Israel, the Hebrews, living on the outskirts of, of Egypt uh, in Goshen. They are now on the, on, the, uh, on the precipice of commencing slavery, being slaves. And it's, it's a horrible time. And no one really knows how quickly um, after they were enslaved, actually, I take that back. You could do the math. I, what I was going to say is no one really knows in terms of how long they were enslaved before Moses comes on the scene. But you could actually do the math because Moses lived for a hundred and 20 years, first 40 years in Egypt, second 40 years uh, in the wilderness. We'll get to that. Third 40 years, him leading the people out of Egypt into the promised land. So that's 120 years. And the Israelites were kept, were enslaved for the Bible speaks of over 400 years. So, so certainly Moses is born not only at a time that is smack dab in the middle of of slavery, but uh, there is this running uh, 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 prophecy of within a certain time of a deliverer coming. That's where we spent last week when Pharaoh instructed and commanded the midwives, right? Pua and Shifra, uh, these women that are probably Egyptians who probably because of their fear of God and obedience to God and not Pharaoh, right, uh, turned their backs on Pharaoh in the first ever recorded civil disobedience to a tyrant in order to obey God. These Egyptians, because of doing that, they may have actually um, felt the repercussions of that if they had children or um, or if uh, their friends had children, because we found out because of the anger of Pharaoh that they did not do that, then he commanded all boys under the age of two, including Egyptians, be killed. This is where uh, Moses, this baby, which is in the first couple of verses of Exodus chapter two, that we are introduced to this 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 uh, formidable character. For the first couple of verses, we don't even have a name. But this is where we are. We begun with basket case and we went to midwifery. Now we are uh, here. Um, and so many believe that the, by way of history, many believe that the princess that uh, takes Moses on and saves his life pretty much uh, and, uh, and, and, and mothers him until he was older is the princess Hajetsut. Hajepsut. She is a princess of Egypt. And I actually went to her palace. It is still there. Her palace was literally built. And I'm going to show a picture. Hopefully I, I remember to send it. If it's, if it's up there, praise God. Uh, it's bad quality, but just it was hot that day. My camera was melting. But the palace is literally 
built into a massive uh, sort of canyon, just really dry rock. Uh, and it's, it's such a, a sight to behold, even uh, till today. And I remember walking this massive entrance just to get to the courtyard, just to get to the front of this mansion of mansions and thinking, if this is Moses' Egyptian mom, I mean, this is where he grew up, Moses. It, it, it just gives me the chills thinking about it right now. Like He walked these halls, these uh, areas, right? Um, and so and so Moses is born, but he, he doesn't have a name. Um, he's put into the basket. And this woman, this princess, is in the River Nile. And she is she's she's bathing she sees this basket doesn't know what's in it doesn't can't hear anything um it, it is retrieved and then she and then she opens and then a baby is in there and the, and she's crying the baby i mean he's crying and uh, miriam is right there again the the bravery of this older daughter this older sister to step up to the princess of egypt and have a conversation and the audacity in what she actually speaks of to the princess but 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 she's protected and so um and so she says you know hey if you want i could find the mother of this child she could actually uh wean this child for the next year or two and when he is ready and of age with health we could bring him back would you like that and she said, "Yes, call her." So Moses' mom uh, comes, and then and then and then the the princess says, "Hey, take care of this boy. I will pay you." Now, can I just say, side note, you know, <laughs> you know, and and I know for her for for his mom, you know, nothing nothing beats actually having my son to myself, and not just only taking care of him for two years, but for for all of his life until he's older. So so no money. Could, could is is, in, is enough, but 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 I think I, I have to. A part of me wants to celebrate with 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 Moses's mom. Why? Because not only did your son not die, praise God, because of your faithfulness, but now you get a chance. Number two, to be with him for at least these first two years of, of even probably three years of weaning him, and then there's an added cherry on the cake that you're going to be paid. Come on. How many mothers <laughs> right here at the sound of my voice or in the church, um, you know, would have, wouldn't mind being paid to take care of your own children. <laughs> uh, maybe that's, I'm just a father. So I'm, mean, oh my gosh, I am not a father. I'm just a man. I would love to be a father. I'm just a man. I don't know. Maybe fathers are like, yeah, that's not how it is. But I mean, that's interesting, right? She's about to, your son survived. You get a chance to take care of him and you're going to be paid for that. Again, I don't think all of that would even add up and equal her actually having her son, but it's seemingly such the next best thing, right? And so Pharaoh's daughter says to her in verse nine, take, take this boy. That Hebrew word take is translated to mean uh, to acknowledge that it belongs to you. So that's actually pretty interesting. So in other words, when the Pharaoh's daughter gives Moses back to his mom, the baby back to his mom, she's saying, I want, I'm, I'm, I want you and I to acknowledge that this baby actually, I acknowledge it and you acknowledge it, that it really belongs to you. Uh, maybe for now. And I recognize that, but eventually I'm going to pay you and eventually you will bring him back to me. So Moses uh, goes with his mom. This baby goes with his mom, and 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 I wonder, you know, how did she keep him? You know, was was she protected? Um, uh, Moses's mom was she protected by Pharaoh's daughter and 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 her army, right? And and even more so, you know, were were other Hebrew moms upset? Think about it. You know, why did why did she get to keep her son? Why did she get to keep her son? And, and have the luxury of that and our sons die, right? Have you ever asked that question? You know, I had one of my friends, you know, he would tell me, he's like, bro, like when his, his, his father died when he was eight years old of cancer. And he said, my dad was one of the best men that you would have ever have, you know, could meet. And he said, um... Yet he would be he would be playing with his other friend whose dad was a drunkard, was an abuser, was an adulterer. And he was like, God, why my dad? Why did you take my dad and, and let Bobby have his adulterous, alcoholic, abusive, beating women, 
you know, a man of a father. But why my dad? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why my marriage? Hmm? Why my child? Huh? Why my community? Huh? Why my friend? Huh? Why me? You know, I'm not trying to say that we're the per I'm, I'm perfect, but why, 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 why me? Why did I have to get the cancer? Why did I have to get uh, the terminal illness? Why did I have to lose my parents? Why am I going through this immense, uh, you know, excruciating emotional pain? Yet that dude down there, I am convinced, is worshiping Satan, and his life is chill. Hmm? Why does she get to keep her son? I wonder what that was like. I wonder if there was tension amongst the Hebrew women. Scholars believed uh, that Moses was brought back to Pharaoh's daughter at about age two or three. Uh, this baby exchange is gleamingly reminiscent of the Genesis account of Sarah and Hagar. We talked about that last year in the series Mountaintops to Valleys, right? Be, um, you know, because... There is a there's gleaming reminiscence with that, right? Because you, here you have an Egyptian woman, Hagar, uh, an Egyptian princess, right? And you have a Hebrew woman, Sarah, and you have a Hebrew woman, Moses' mom. Well, with Hagar and Sarah, um, you know, Hagar gives birth and then gives Ishmael, because that's what it was supposed to be, gives Ishmael to Sarah, right? And then you fast forward. And then you have a Hebrew woman giving birth and gives her son to an Egyptian woman. It's a lot of parallels there. So after two to three years, Moses, the baby, was, uh, uh, was, was brought back uh, and returned to Pharaoh's uh, daughter. It, it, it was then that the Bible says that he was given the name Moses. Two to three years. That actually made sense because in the Egyptian lifestyle, um, the infant mortality rate was quite high between the ages of one to three. Babies would die. A lot of them would die. And so they would wait until age three to name the baby because after that, there was a higher probability that they would survive. That's why many scholars believe they waited until that time, that age, to give the name Moses. Moses as 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 a baby what well, would have been presented to Pharaoh himself that for me is quite fascinating and I'll get back to that towards the end of this message so stick around uh we're told repeatedly in scripture of Moses's humility right that that the man Moses was a very humble man. It's just funny because I said it before. Moses is the one that writes that exact statement. Uh, I'll get back to that in this series because I've gotten some new research that makes me think otherwise about that statement. Um, and I'll, I'll explain later. But, 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 I, but I do believe that he was humble. Absolutely. And I got to thinking, did this humble spirit commence as a boy in a palace? Because if it were me, I probably would not be humble. I probably would be full of pride. Again, being there, I mean, th you are rich. Not only are you the richest family in the then known world, but you are the most powerful family in the then known world. But, 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 but Moses was humble. And I don't know when his humility started. Maybe it began while he was in the wilderness. We'll get to that. Uh, maybe, it, 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 you know, in the first time, you know, maybe it was done only after he met God face to face. We'll get to that. Or maybe it did start in the palace as a boy. Perhaps this modesty was possible because Moses had a minor sense of self-worth found on account of being adopted and living in Pharaoh's household. You know, many, uh, maybe, sorry, Moses knew that he was adopted and like many adoptees felt insecure about his origins. You know, mental health uh, professionals are surprised at the alarming high number of their patients who are adopted. Studies show uh, that an average of 25 to 35% of young people in residential treatment centers are adoptees. This is 17 times the norm. 60 to 85% of teens at the Coldwater Canyon Center, for example, for personal development, are adopted. 
That is 30 to 40 times the norm. The center is a private acute care uh, psychiatric hospital school in Southern California. Perhaps Moses wondered why his birth parents abandoned him. Hmm. No matter how much wealth you have, no matter how much power you have, uh, no matter how much position and prestige you may have, could it be possible that there is that, that there could be a lowness of 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 self worth on account of you not biologically belonging to your family that you were adopted and maybe Moses felt that way. Maybe Moses constantly asked the question, did they, did my birth parents not want me? You know, I don't know if they taught him what happened during the time of his birth, but did that play a role in, 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 in his sort of birthing a, a humble, maybe quiet spirit? It could be uh, Moses molded and, 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 and looked physically different than the noble Egyptians for sure. Maybe he was darker. Maybe he had lighter skin. Maybe his Semitic nose was more hooked uh, than the rest of them. Maybe he was bullied. This is a huge problem in America and in schools all over the world, bullying. I mean, I see it all the time in my travels. American schools harbor, they say, approximately 2.1 million bullies and 2.7 million of their victims, right? Bullying is a real thing. 71% of students report incidents of being bullied at school and 15% of all school absent uh, reports are on account of them being bullied. That was me. <laughs> There were times when I was in middle school and I, and I acted like I was sick to my mom because I was being bullied at school. I have stories about that. I think of one of my biggest bullies. I don't know where he is today. God bless him. His name was Rashid. Just saying his name gives me the creeps, <laughs> right? Um, and, and he would always bully me. Uh, you know, um, they were, the, the name that he, he gave me was Headley because I had a big head, physically big head, probably still did today. He would say, Headley, where are you heading to? Headquarters? <laughs> Y'all better not be laughing. You better not be laughing, right? Uh, but bullying is a real thing. And, 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 and we've seen it in recent years, the last two decades, how bullying has led to kids literally uh, uh, carrying out the committing of suicide. Right? They say a high percentage of, say, for example, bodybuilders, men in gyms, have an extremely low self esteem. A recent study documented that 48% of pastors go into ministry, choose to go into ministry because of low self esteem issues, hoping that ministry would cure it. That right there. A lot of you may be going, ah, oh, having experiences with, other, with, with pastors before, um, um, especially in some churches. If you, if, you, if you struggle with a low self-esteem, you become a pastor, it could build your, your self-esteem, right? Everyone's taking the time, 45 minutes, to listen to your sermon, everything you have to say. There's a pastor's uh, uh, parking, parking uh, space just for you, your own office, and pastor this, and pastor that. And, and most people don't go, it seems that like 48% of them tend not to even go into ministry because of their natural calling to it, but because of low self-esteem. Maybe it was his, Moses, his impediment of, of lack of being able to speak uh, uh, that set him apart. Or maybe this, is, this speech impediment, this was a, it was a stutter, like I have a stutter. And for some reason, that stutter may have come about possibly because of his psychological issues. Um, but, but, but for whatever it is, whether it's low self-esteem or, or bullying uh, 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 or, or, or thoughts of suicide, whatever it is, Moses probably felt abandoned. What do you do when you feel abandoned? What do you do when you feel alone? What do you do when you feel like you don't belong? What do you do when you feel unloved? And as Moses 
may have asked himself these questions, he understood that the Hebrew people could have been asking the same question, uh, feeling that maybe God has abandoned them. Moses thinks his family abandons them, uh, 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 you know, abandoned him. The Hebrew people, there must have been moments when they thought, God, have you abandoned us? God, we don't belong here. We're out of water here. God, we feel unrecognized, unloved. Yet all through his story, Moses, we can clearly see God's hands working. Someone say amen. Sometimes we can only see God working after after we are out of the storm, yet we should trust that though we cannot see it, that God is working through the storm. It is often in hindsight, it is often after the fact that we look back and we recognize, ah, that was you, God. I, okay, got you. <laughs> uh, author Rabbi Vysotsky, uh, I love his book on this topic of Exodus. He says this, write this down. This is for me very encouraging. He says, if Jesus heals instantly, praise him. If Jesus heals gradually, trust him. When Jesus heals, ultimately, you'll understand. Oh, come on, somebody shout amen. I'll, I'll say it again. If Jesus heals instantly, go on and praise him. If he heals gradually, trust him. When he eventually, ultimately heals, you'll understand. Because God is always working. God is, there's never a time when God is sitting on his royals. There's never a time when God is not aware of your situation. There's never a time when God is on a hike somewhere for a couple of thousands of years and then he returns and he says, hey, what's been going on in the life of Ron, in the life of Betty, in the life of Tucson, in the life of Sister Mosley? No, 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 no. He is always aware. He is always paying attention. He is always looking. God and I would submit he is always working even when you can't trace it. I, I, I wonder when, when older Moses was writing the book of Exodus, essentially his story, that, that when, when he wrote the Hebrew word for put or place, you know, when the Bible says that the baby, because he's he, you know, thinking I was abandoned, right? Like I was just flung into a basket. I was flung into this netted thing and, and sent on my way, you know, fingers crossed that like I was abandoned. I, I wonder if it clicked to Moses because when the, when the Bible speaks of that he was put or he was placed in the basket, the Hebrew words there for put place literally means gently and lovingly. Oh, come on, somebody. Gently, so 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 when Moses' mom placed him in the basket, she was doing it gently and lovingly. Moses, you are loved. There is another word in the Hebrew that 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 speaks to the word abandon. That's not the word used there. Gently and lovingly. I could just visualize it with me. Like she places him in the back. I, I can't imagine as a mom. I cannot imagine this. I really cannot. You know, putting your son in the basket in, in the river now. We've talked about that. But so she's putting him in there, making sure his little cute little cute little arms are placed in really well. His feet are not are not gonna be trapped when it's closed and he's at least comfortable, give and take, right? I mean, she must be thinking, uh, I would love him to go down this river uh, in silence because if he cries out, he would get the attention of not just the authorities, but of, of the crocs, the crocodiles, right? But she puts him in there. The Bible says she puts him in there. She cares about him carefully, gently, and lovingly. She, she did not abandon him, right? That, that Moses was intentionally, he was planned, he was positioned, and he was placed in gently and lovingly into the basket, into the ark, into the divine protection of God that he was not abandoned. And, and that when God placed you where you are, yeah, you, I'm talking to you, when, when, when God placed you where, where you have been placed, he did not abandon you. Someone needs to know that you're not abandoned this morning. That you're not alone this morning. 
That even though you may find yourself in a situation that either was out of your control or within your control, but wherever you are, whether it was your own doing, your own choices, your own mistakes, or it was somebody else's doing, their choices, their mistakes, it was out of your control. Regardless, wherever you are, you have been gently taken care of and loved by God, and he's aware of your situation. He's not just only aware, he is with you, God with us, Emmanuel, and he has not, and he refuses to abandon you. I wonder if older Moses now can see that this, this, this naked Egyptian woman who would soon become his mom, I wonder if he could see this naked Egyptian woman was placed there by God with plans to preserve his life through adoption to free God's people eventually. And that when there seems to be no hope and there is danger ahead, that God has a plan even if you are not physically protected. I wonder if older Moses now can see that, that that crying can be used for something good. That if he did not cry, watch this. She, If you read the narrative, what caused her to gain attention of the basket was the fact that he was crying. Some of us need to actually start crying out. You know, because 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 not just to other people, that's extremely important that you and I are not meant to do life alone, that, that God wants you to find a community, a inner circle of people that you love and that you trust and that could speak life into you and that could lift you up and that could journey with you and that could hold you accountable. But people are not going to offer help to you if you don't cry out. That is why a lot of people feel abandoned, and not only abandoned, but they feel also hopeless. Because if you're not sharing that you are in trouble, or that you have an issue, or that you have a problem, or an addiction, then no one's going to offer help. You don't need help. And by the way, that's where sin flourishes. It flourishes in secret, right? It is in the crying out. You remember I did a sermon talking about Jesus walking on water and he's walking and he and, and he dis, and he's planning on as if to pass the disciples by and they cry out to him and they don't cry out with faith. They don't cry out in hope. They don't cry out with happiness. The Bible says they cry out in fear. How many of you know this morning that Jesus does not care about the DNA of your cry? All that he cares about is that you cry out to heaven. And that because Moses cried, it got the attention of Pharaoh's daughter. By the way, this is interesting. There is only one time in all of scripture, only one time in all of scripture that the Bible records a baby crying. And guess where that is? <laughs> guess where that is right here. It's the only time a baby cries or is recorded. Of course, babies cry all the time. Yes, including Jesus when he was born. Don't, don't get me started with that. <laughs> Christ didn't come on earth like this. Oh. Nah, that, that little, you know, he was crying, okay? He was crying. But the only time this is a baby crying is documented in scripture is right here. It's significant. And that today, God says, cry out to me. Cry out to me. Not just to those in your inner circle. That's good. But cry out to me. Because... What the earth has to offer, there are some really good things the earth has to offer that could help heal you. Counseling, uh, uh, you know, friends to hold you accountable, um, even nature. Man, go out, go out into nature with friends, go camping, go for a hike, go swimming, go kayaking. Yeah, nature, David says the heavens declare the glory of God. These are all great things. But they also point to the only thing that could fully and holistically heal you in your state of sin. And that's God. Cry out to him. <laughs> Cry out to him. It was Moses who would then later write in the book of Deuteronomy 
chapter 31, verse 8, he would say, it is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. It was David who would write in Psalms 34, verse 17, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all of their troubles. David will continue in Psalms 3. Oh Lord, how many are my adversaries that have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul that there is no deliverance for, for him and God. But, but you, oh Lord, are a shield around me. My glory, the one who lifts my head. And it was Jesus who said in John 16, 33, I have said these things to you that in me you have peace, that in the world you will have tribulation. Uh -oh, but, 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 but take heart. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, take heart. Uh, be of good courage. I, Jesus have said, I have already overcome this world. Jesus is in control of the galaxy, but more so. More than that, he desires to be the leader of my life and of your life today. And for some of us, all God is waiting for is a cry out to him. It's all he's waiting for is a cry out to him. Jesus not only wants to lead you, he desires to be with you to heal you, and he desires to use you today. To you, I'm gonna have our keyboardist come and play right now. Just come play right now. Hopefully we have someone at Pontiac. <laughs> he desires to use you today. And you may say, not me, Lord. I'm broken, I'm flawed. I have a physical disability. I have a mental disease. I am psychologically depressed. How many of us know today that not only are these things no issue for God, but that in fact he will use the very thing you think is a disability and capitalize on it for his glory? I know it. I've seen it. I am exhibit A, right? In this series, I will refer sometimes to a document called Midrash, M-I-D-R-A-S-H. What is a Midrash? A Midrash is biblical exegesis by ancient Judaic authorities using a, a mode of interpretation prominent in the, in the Bible. So these are Jewish uh, leaders over the last two, three thousand years that have read biblical, uh, 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 you know, uh, the narratives um, and are giving further explanations and additional thought to these stories. Midrashes are quite fascinating, and I would highly recommend that if you could get your hands on a couple of them that it would just make your reading of scripture so much more richer, I believe, humbly. So I've done a lot of reading of midrashes, Judaic midrashes. And there's a couple of things that I found uh, as, as I've studied through the book of Exodus. So in speaking of God, can you use me? Can you use me? I, I can't, I can't speak, God. I stutter. Moses had a stutter. This would soon be one of his biggest, if not his only excuse, when he will meet God face to face in a couple of decades to come. Some have argued, how did Moses get his stutter? The two main ideas is, one, he had emotional issues that could lead to stuttering. But amongst the Jews, even till today, there is a more prominent 
uh, a view. This view I find quite fascinating. Now, this is not found in the Bible. This is a Judaic Midrash that give their take on how they think Moses gained this speech impediment. What they've done is they've studied the history and the practices of the Egyptians. When I read this, this got me really excited. Okay, got me really excited. So here's what would have probably happened, could have, could have possibly happened to Moses. So when his mother, his Egyptian mother, brought him to Pharaoh, she had to do that, right? I mean, that's her dad. And she's not going to hide the, that she has a son. And again, against popular belief within the movies of Moses, everyone knew he was not Egyptian, okay? He didn't look Egyptian at all. I mean, the brother was circumcised, okay? Um, so bringing him to Pharaoh, Pharaoh knew right away he was, he was a Hebrew. And we talked about it about two weekends ago. Why did Pharaoh not kill him? Well, um, we, we believe that one of the arguments his daughter would have used was the Nile saved him. And the Nile was one of their gods, right? And so the story goes that Pharaoh held um, Moses. And this is documented in Egyptian history. When the Pharaoh holds a baby, if the baby uh, reaches for his crown, a lot of their laws were, were, were uh, dipped in superstition. If the baby went for the crown, it was told and taught that it's a 50-50 it's a, it's a chance that this is the baby prophetically saying, when I, when I get older, I will be coming for your crown and I will dethrone you, Pharaoh, and I will become king. It's 50-50 because it's either that or the baby just saw something that glittered and, as all babies do, reach, reached for it. But they don't know. So the priest put together something to test the baby. What they would do is they would take the baby, put it in like a little playpen, all right? On one side, they would put the crown of Pharaoh. And on the other side, they would put hot coals that flickered because it was hot coals. And they would put the baby in. If the baby went for the crown, to them in their theology, that meant the baby was saying, I will dethrone the Pharaoh. And you know what would happen right then and then? Pharaoh's princess's son or not, or not they would kill the baby right then. If the baby goes for the hot coals, then they would say, oh, okay, it just wants to go for something that glitters, and that's fine. So the story goes, they put Moses in this playpen, and he starts to go towards the crown, but then switches and goes for the coals. And when, it, when, when he did that, all the adults, they began celebrating. They didn't really pay attention to Moses because he kept on going, according to the story. And what do babies do when they grab something or they see something that's, that's nice? For whatever reason, they want to, you know, bite it. They want to put it in its mouth. So the story goes that Moses puts the hot coals on his mouth and it burns his mouth. Many believe that that gave Moses his speech impediment. Now, that excites me. <laughs> if, 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 that would have, if that would have been the case, that excites me. Because you go to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah is in vision, and in vision he gets to see into heaven. And he sees heaven in all of its glory. He in vision sees the holy of holies, the holy one sitting and he sees angels and thousands of thousands of angelic forces. And Isaiah wants to speak, but he feels that he's not worthy. And so an angel comes to him, read it, Isaiah 6. An angel comes to him and Isaiah says, I can't speak. I'm unworthy. 
And what does the angel do? This is known within ancient theology, especially amongst the Hebrews. Something that, that identifies cleaning of your mouth is by taking hot coals and placing it on your mouth. The angel does that to Isaiah. Then he says, now your mouth is clean. Now you could speak on behalf of God. That excites me because Moses is a baby, right? Has no idea this is happening. And if this is to be true, and this is how he gets his speech impediment, God is preparing him and saying, there's going to come a time that you will tell me, Moses, I cannot speak. But Moses, you need to know I have already prepared you, even through your disabilities, even through what you may think is something that will be a hindrance that you cannot speak. I have already called you. I have already anointed you and I have appointed you to soon be the deliverer through my hands of my people. God desired Moses to know that. That even when he sees something that could be negative, God will use it for positive. God wanted Moses to know that when, when he sees danger, God sees a rescue. What you see is a coffin, Moses, but God sees an ark. What you see is the river of death, Moses, but God sees a river to life. What you see uh, is, is abandonment, Moses, but God sees an ever-present embrace of love. Uh, what you see, Moses, is a stuttering speech uh, de a defect, but God sees uh, a mouth that would be able to call down plagues and speak powerful to terrify the ears of Pharaoh and get the attention of God. What you see is a naked woman of doom, but God sees the doorway to your deliverance. Turning a negative into a positive because God is always, always in control. Always. So I'll end with this story. Uh, it's good news, man. That's, that's, that's great news. I end with this story. I remember uh, my friend telling me this about a friend of his that... When he was a baby, his mom and his sister and himself, they were driving from his father's college and they were driving home, it was a couple hours to their home in Southern California. And I forget what happened, whether if it's the mom who fell asleep or, or something happened, there was a, a, a hindrance in the road, something happened that caused them to go off the road and the car flipped about five times, coming to an end. Um, he shared that the mom went unconscious. It was cold. And the mom went unconscious. And the ambulance would tell her, the EMT would tell them later that if she had stayed unconscious, unconscious, that she would have frozen to death. She would have died. So what caused her to wake up? Story goes that while she was spun over, somehow these red fiery ants <laughs> got into the car and began biting her body relentlessly. The pain woke her up, but she thanks God for the painful bites of those ants because if it were not for them, them inflicting pain on her body, she would have remained unconscious and not only would she have died, her two kids would have died with her. It woke her up, caused her to unbuckle, pull the kids out, and flag down for help. Some of us are experiencing pain right now. And let me say this. God doesn't like pain. He, 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 he's not a fan of it. It was, not his, it was not his plan 
for the original uh, design of earth. And there are some pains that God really did not plan for us to have in our lives. Some pain is because of our own doing, our own choices. But there is some pain that God will allow in order to get us to the next level of life. If it means ants biting you, <laughs> yeah, take that pain now. Because the greater pain is you dying in your sins. If this lesser pain wakes you up, if this lesser pain causes you to find your dreams and live it out, to find your calling and live it out, then that pain, not now, doesn't feel that way, but eventually you'd understand. I will understand that that pain was worth it all. So where are you this morning? What pains are you experiencing this morning? Is it God trying to wake you up? Is God trying to say, hey, I know you have what you may think is a disability. You don't like it. It pains you. But is God saying, I want to use that. That's what I want to use to save you and to use you to help me, God, save others. What is that? What is that for you in your life today? I want you to recognize what that is and surrender it to God. Let's pray. Father, Lord, there are many things in our lives that we see as negative and many of it might just be that. Whether it's our own doing or the doing of others, situations we have found ourselves in. But Father, somehow through those circumstances, you are writing a story, a story that is not outside of these realities. It's within them to capitalize on what Satan has wished for our doom you have orchestrated for our deliverance. So whatever that is, Lord, you don't design and plan for divorces and broken homes to happen, but you could use that. You don't design or wish for us to have addictions, but you could use that. You, you don't glory in us having disabilities, but you could use that. You don't celebrate when we are brought into the authorities and, and maybe even placed in prison, but you could use that. <laughs> Whatever you need to use, Lord, do it. And I get it, that's easier said than done. But you know what's best. So, Father, we surrender our lives to you today. Have your way in us. Help us to trust you more. And help us to get to the point in our, in our Christian walk that if you heal immediately, that we could praise you. If you heal gradually, that we could trust you. And when you heal, ultimately, we will fully understand. Thank you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Remember, next week, we're not going to be on here. There's camp meeting, LRC, and then we'll see you for part four on July the 3rd. God bless you. Take care.